The music stopped, so I presume that means that was my signal to get going. Um, come on in and uh, grab a seat if That's you would. How that works. Appreciate you coming out on this beautiful, beautiful afternoon. Uh, yeah, I know. Everybody says, yes, it's beautiful out there. Uh, for our fifth church family meeting. And um, this is, it's been great to see the group here, uh, people taking such interest in uh, the future of the church. It's just been fantastic. Very, very uh, encouraging for us to see your involvement. You know, we've talked about a lot of things over the last several meetings, uh, repeated a couple of things. Uh, but hopefully in each one you've got some new information, you've gained a little bit more uh, in terms of what we're thinking, where we're going, etc. Today, we're going to focus very much on the vision and what's next. So uh, I'm going to open this up in prayer and ask God to bless our time together, and then I'll turn it over to Jeff, and uh, we'll go from there, okay? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this church. Uh, you're just such an awesome God, and uh, it is such a privilege and a pleasure to serve you in, in this church and in, in all around the world as, as we've sent people and, and we encourage uh, those to uh, just continue to uh, follow your great commission, to, to go out and serve the world, to bring those lost to you. It's, it is a privilege. And Lord, today, as we consider what vision you have for us, the next steps for ha you have for us, we just ask for wisdom. We ask for uh, hearts and minds to hear what you'd have us to hear. Uh, and Lord, we just ask that you'd bless our time together today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay? Jeff, over to you. Okay. Um, thanks, Ken. Well, Ken said we're going to talk mostly about uh, the vision and the neighborhood church. And we're going to get to a lot of the details and specifics around the plan. And this may be review for a lot of you who have been tracking with us online through the recorded version of the meetings or those of you who attended the meetings. But that's okay. I think it's good to keep repeating the story of what's brought us to this point. And so I'm going to back up and tell uh, a couple of things. How did this vision start? What, how has it grown and what's, how has it been affirmed? Um, try to be as specific as I can about what it is and what it might look like as we go forward. And then turn it over to Brian for, to give us some uh, details around uh, how the plan actually is going to be accomplished. Uh, so when the transition plan, senior pastor transition plan became public between Brian and I last year, it's amazing to think that's almost a year ago. Um, I was humbled and um, anxious and excited and, um, and felt very affirmed by our congregation. But one of the th questions in my mind was, what's the vision going forward? People would ask me questions like, what's your vision for the church? And I didn't have a good answer except to say, mm, more of the same. Reach, connect, equip, serve. Glorify God, the gospel, you know, Jesus, keep going. So I didn't really have much more to say. Um, which I think is a good thing. You don't have to have something new. But I felt somewhat insecure about that. Not that it was about me, but it, it, was, it was stern in me. Like, what, what is the vision uh, going forward? Is it different? Is it going to look different? Um, about, Brian will tell this story partly, but we were approached by Faith Baptist and initially all said no. Uh, but felt in our spirit that there was something, maybe we had left a stone unturned or maybe we should not be so quick to say no just because we couldn't see it. And so part of the, our way of getting in an answer to that was to bring in a consultant named Jim Tomberlin. He works for multi-site solutions. He used to work at Willow Creek Community Church, was a pastor in Colorado, but his primary job now is helping churches navigate what it means to become a multi-site with campuses. There's lots of ways to do that. He visited our site, visited all of our services, met with us and with our staff. We had a conference call with the EC with him. One of the things he said over dinner on his very first visit here was we all said, maybe this church is just too close. And he said, well, actually, it might be the perfect location if you think of yourself as kind of a new parish model, like you guys could become a neighborhood church. He threw that word, that phrase in just between bites over dinner. Something in my spirit stirred. I thought about that word all night. I stayed up thinking about it, texted Brian about it. We talked about it on staff as our senior management team at our EC level. And every time we talked about it, it began to take shape in our minds and hearts of what that would look like. Um, so we, we're using the vision statement, and this will be on the screen here, a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives to impact the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, in a nutshell, what we're talking about. Now, the reason to go multi-site, this is the why behind the vision, the reason to become a third campus, we're already multi-site, but the reason to take on a third campus is not because it's trendy. I want you to be clear about that. Not because other churches are doing it. By the way, more than 5,000 churches are multi-site in the nation. All of the fastest growing churches in the nation are multi-site. 
60% of traditional church plants fail within three years. Almost 80%, 78% of campuses succeed in three years because the infrastructure and resources. All of those reasons are not reasons in and of themselves to do it. The reason to do it is not because it's trendy, not because we're stuck, not because it might be you know, fun or we think it's what other churches are doing. The reason is because we believe it's the most effective way to further the gospel mission that God has given us. That's the reason to do it. Um, and so we use the phrase family of neighborhood churches. Family, that's an intentionally chosen word. We're a family-oriented church. We minister, the center of our bell curve, Brian often says, is, is families with children still living at home. Not exclusively. We have lots, we have a, run the whole gamut of single individuals and people in empty nesters and all, all, all kinds, but that's kind of the center of our community here and, of our, and we talk about that. A family of churches, families share the same DNA. One of the things Tomberlin said to us is you have not only the opportunity, but the responsibility to reproduce who you are as a church. The reason, you don't have to be maxed out in your facility to multi-site. It's not primarily a space issue, but you do have to be healthy. It's a multiplication issue. He says, you have an, a, a responsibility to reproduce who you are as a church. That was encouraging to think about that. So families have the same DNA. We want to reproduce the healthy DNA. <laughs> Maybe get rid of some of the unhealthy DNA if there is some, right? Families share the same leadership, the same direction. Families share the same history, the stories you tell in your family. We share that. And families share the same resources. So we talk about it that way for, with an, for an intentional reason. Because it's easy to think we're going to do something out there for them. No, this is a family, one family of neighborhood churches. It's going to be becoming part of who we are. Um, we've talked about this frequently. Uh, but one of the questions that surfaced for us was, do we really believe that the end game, if we're going to continue to reach, connect, equip, and serve, if that's going to produce gospel multiplication and growth in our church, which it is, and that's going to continue... What's, the, what's that going to look like? Is it going to be a bigger box out here in the hopes that more people will drive from farther away to attend? Which we don't think so. We think no. The answer to that is no. That does not mean we shouldn't invest any more resources here at our East Campus. We shouldn't care about these facilities. We should. What it means is what's the, how are we going to multiply our impact? Build a giant box or reproduce ourselves in neighborhood churches? That's what it comes down to. That is the why behind the vision. And the last thing I'll say before I turn it over to Brian is that I was asked this question by, is Bill Berg here? He asked me this question. Where, yeah, yeah, Bill, just today. We've asked a bunch of times, but Bill put it very succinctly, grabbed me in the hall at the East Campus, and he said, tell me what it means to be a neighborhood church. What does that mean with this intense stare that Bill has, you know? So we're still working that out, but here's, essentially, it's a very good question. At the heart of what it means to be a neighborhood church is not about the geography of the location, although that's important and we'll talk about that. The heart of it is God's people loving and serving their neighbors for the sake of the gospel. That's the heart of the neighborhood church vision. We think what that will look like is multiple campuses, not a giant box. But the heart of the neighborhood church vision is not like, oh, let's, 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 let's grab that church because it's financially good or exciting and call it neighborhood church. That's not what's in my heart. What's in my heart is our people increasingly grasp the vision to reach their neighbors for Christ to serve them and to love them. And that will produce multiplication of churches, uh, neighborhood, neighborhood churches. So um, there'll be more to talk about this as we go, but I'm gonna turn it over to Brian kind of to give you a little more history and, oh no, turn it over to Ken. Ken, would you like to speak now? Yes, I would. Uh, okay. Um, let me talk about it now? Or no, I, whenever you want. Um, okay. You, what you have in your hands, this lovely, <laughs> glossy uh, little uh, brochure here, answers a lot of these questions uh, about the neighborhood church. Um, it answers the, the question that you, that you asked there, what does it mean to be a neighborhood church? It gets at specifically some of the, uh, the why we're considering the merger. I won't read the, through this to you, but you can read at your own leisure. Um, I do, I do want to read, I, I forgot to mention a couple slides that I, we used last time, which I want to bring up this time. And that is, uh, just, if you were here last meeting or watched online, you saw these. But this is a map of the Kane County area. Uh, and it shows you um, in red and then down to green areas of projected growth by the Census Bureau. That This study is public information, but the red areas show you areas of um, uh, negative growth, and the green areas are projected growth. You see the three stars. The blue star is our east campus. Yellow star is our west campus. The green star in the center of the map is the Faith Baptist current site. You'll notice that that green star is smack in the middle of an area of projected growth for the future. That's significant to us when you think about the location. 
The next uh, image will show you these are the same three stars on the same map, but these red balloons are not hot air balloons. Those are families in our church database. Those are people, FBCG families. Each one of those balloons represents an address in our database. Notice the concentration of balloons just to the north and around that green star. And the next slide will show you kind of those two things put together. You see that campus, well, you know, initially we're thinking, is it too close to us? It's right in the middle of an area of projected growth for the future, and it's right where we have a concentration of families in that Mill Creek area. That's what's right to the north of it there. It is on the south edge of the Mill Creek community. So to north is Mill Creek. You'll see all those, those, those balloons there. The circle drawn there is, uh, is just to show you that you know, we already have a saturation with our east and west campus reaching the, the area to the, to, the, to the right or the east of that. The circle there is to, to show you the opportunity we have to reach right around Mill Creek and to the west. So thanks for that reminder. <laughs> You're welcome. I forgot we, I asked them to put those slides together and I forgot to talk about them. <laughs> so um, the, the, what I want to talk about is sort of where we are in the process with Faith Baptist. As, as Jeff just talked about, uh, we have been, and you've heard in the previous meetings, we've been going through a process with Faith Baptist. We've been going through sort of the feasibility uh, elements, and I uh, have to give a lot of credit to Doug Kite and team who have been doing a tremendous amount of work um, not with all the stuff behind the scenes. And for those of you who um, are familiar with, you know, uh, acquisitions, mergers, etc. you know there's a lot of things that have to go on behind the scenes. So we've met with their board several times. We've worked through all the major questions uh, that are, um, you know, that we have to work through to make sure that we're both aligned on what would happen and everything from how do we handle the facilities to uh, the finances to personnel to uh, philosophies, etc. And we've worked through all those major questions and we're very much aligned. Uh, we've also worked through all of the legal issues, so getting permission from the county, working with Show Dean, who has some uh, remaining rights because he donated the land to Faith Baptist, and we've worked through all that, gotten permission to move forward uh, from his organization. So basically, uh, most of the, the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. Where we are today really is moving to that final element, which is the vote by both of our congregation's memberships. So ours is uh, obviously planned for uh, August 21st at our annual meeting. Theirs will be approximately the same time. Uh, we're actually meeting with their uh, membership tonight uh, on their campus to work through final questions, just to make sure that we can be present to answer many of the questions. And uh, basically, it's a session very much like this one for their membership. So that'll be tonight at 6 o'clock. And then again, uh, like us, they will move forward with next steps. So the process, again, pretty much uh, done with all the various steps leading up to the vote. Um, and uh, from that standpoint, uh, we're basically ready to move forward. Uh, now what we want to do now is really talk about the rest of the picture, and Brian's going to take us through next steps. My job is to get you eventually in about 10 minutes or so to the question that's, I'm assuming, starting to swirl around in your minds if you've been coming to these meetings. And that question is, okay, what's it going to cost? But well, we're going to get there in just a couple minutes. So let me back up a little bit. Let me tell a little bit of the, the story um, because it, uh, it, uh, I, it's important to, 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 to consider all these things in a context, in the context of who we are as a church and what we have been and where we've been. We opened this campus that we call our West Campus in 2004 after a four or five year process of leadership um, work. Uh, we purchased a property, some of you will remember, in about 1999, uh, after looking all over the place for several years, uh, we purchased this property for almost $2 million, around about 22 and a half acres right here at this campus. And then we built phase one in 2004 at a cost of about $8 million. So the whole thing was about $10 million to get our foothold out here uh, in this new property. And at that time, uh, we fully intended to build out the rest of the floor plan we had put together for this site, which was to move everything out here, sell the East Campus, and put our whole church out here, including a massive 2,000-seat sanctuary that was going to go right out there on the grass that's uh, just to the uh, north of this building right here. Uh, this room was only intended to be a temporary home for worship until we could build the massive sanctuary to host all of us out there. 
So we opened in 2004. We experienced immediate growth, dramatic growth, double digit every year for a couple of years as we opened this campus. And that's the way it continued for a couple of years. Then in 2008, just about the time we were starting to get out the plans again to look, is it time to do the next phase out here? Is it time to build the sanctuary? What's next? Uh, the economy went south in our whole nation. So we put everything on hold. We just survived for a couple of years um, as a church with our ministries and all our staff and so forth. And during that next couple of years, uh, again, through leadership discussions and, and prayer and just wrestling through lots of stuff, we decided that it seemed to us that God was li leading us to accept that we were going to be multiple campuses for the foreseeable future, that we weren't going to move everything out here, that the expense of that was just going to be too great uh, at that time, that, that, we, that we'd learned how to do ca two campuses, that we're having an impact as two campuses, that maybe that's the direction he had for us. And that, t that happened that decision was made in sometime around 2010 or so. But we continued to grow, although that growth uh, began to take a little bit of different shape. And you've heard us talk about this. It, it was taking shape not just on, and in worship services. The growth of the 80s and 90s was in our weekend worship. The growth that started to happen in the 2000s was more growth in our midweek ministries, in our departmental ministries, in women's ministries, in special needs ministries, uh, and that sort of thing. But we were still experiencing growth, and our budgets continued to climb even after we went through the recession. Uh, in about 2012 or so, we began to, um, to look at what's next. We were seeing this growth. We're seeing things happen. We needed some space. We're having some felt needs in some different areas. And so that, at that time, we worked and put together what we then called our Growing to Serve Ministry Expansion Project. And let me just tick through the details of that. We settled after, again, a year or more of uh, study and planning and meeting with consultants and so forth and focus groups with the congregation. We settled on a $9 million ministry expansion project. It had three main uh, focus, focal points. First was debt reduction. At that time, we still owed about $800,000 on the $8 million uh, cost of this facility, we wanted to pay that off first. And then we were going to renovate the East Campus, which was in terrible need of it in the lower level. Uh, that renovation uh, included uh, creating space for our Shepherd's Heart Care Center. Uh, for, it included some remodel of the sanctuary. It included remodel in the lobby. Recruited, included the complete remodel of the lower level at the East Campus, which was, hadn't been touched in probably close to 50 years. It also included the West addition here at West Campus, on the north side, the plan was to add specialized rooms for masterpiece ministries, for uh, ministries to children with special needs, uh, breakout rooms for our midweek ministries, women's ministries, and others that needed, special, uh, needed their space. On the south side, it was going to include a brand new lobby that extended the length of the building here and some new office complexes uh, right out here. When we added all of that up, it was about $9 million, maybe a little bit more than that. We ended up uh, in the campaign reducing that phase uh, are growing to serve uh, phase one to about a five and a half to six million dollar project be, uh, because we believe we came to terms with that was what we thought we could raise from our congregation and we didn't want to take on uh, the rest of it in debt. So we decided not to do the south end at all at that time. And so that's what we did. Paid off our debt, renovated the east, and we added that part to west. The total cost of that uh, it comes out to be somewhere between five and a half and six. We are on schedule to, to finish paying that roughly by the end of this year, maybe shortly after that. And so we've done well there. Well, we didn't do a whole piece of what that plan was. And that piece, um, if we put a number to that, it would have been uh, between three and four million at the time. If we add in inflation over the last couple of years, plus opening up the construction process again, would have been roughly four and a half million dollars or so to finish what we thought we were going to do out here on the south side of this, uh, this facility. So we left that on the table for future sometime. And we experienced continued growth. In the last couple of years since we did, uh, we done finished growing to serve, um, we've set records the last two years um, consecutively on Christmas Eve with our worship attendance on Christmas Eve. Uh, we've seen record uh, attendance at our Holy Week communion services and Easter attendance. In fact, we've had several events where we saw people walking out the door because they couldn't find a seat in the room, even when we maxed it out with, with standing room only space at special events. Our women's ministry has sold out a number of events in the last couple of years, but had to shut off registrations because nobody else could fit into this facility. Uh, we've seen uh, 
needs in our nurseries recently, where uh, midweek especially, we've had to uh, shift children over rooms that weren't prepared for them because we've had too many young babies and children, which is great news for a church. I call that church growth the old-fashioned way when you're adding younger generation families who are still having children. Uh, and our special needs ministry has just exploded over the last couple of years with the development of Masterpiece and those rooms and Buddy Break, and many of you serve in Buddy Break. We're becoming kind of a beacon church in this whole region for that kind of ministry, which is incredibly gratifying and important to us. And Shepherd's Heart has probably tripled in size and scope in ministry since we gave it its dedicated space at the East Campus. So all that to say is, Growing to, phase, growing to serve phase one, even though we did not do one whole portion of it, has proved tremendous impact in terms of gospel ministry for our church family. So uh, that continued for a couple of years, and we're moving toward finishing off uh, uh, that project in terms of paying for it. And so last year, uh, it was time for us to get out the growing to serve plans again, as we always do. Uh, is it time to start looking at the rest of that? Is it the right thing we have on the table? Is that what we should build? Is that an all? And we started looking at that, and right about that time was when we got approached by Mill Creek. And Jeff has told you that story today, how that started the wheels spinning, started us praying, started us talking, started the, uh, the fire of kind of a new vision that's slowly taken shape over the last 12 months or more to where we are uh, right here. Um, the, we brought in uh, a consultant, several consultants, Jim Tomberlin being one of them, uh, that Jeff has referred to. We brought in Aspen, which is our design build firm we've worked with for the last almost decade. Um, we had a series of uh, focus groups with our staff and leadership um, back uh, starting in the, in the, in the, in the early uh, well, in the early months of this year, January, February, March, right around there, studying growth patterns, our ministry needs, where we're growing, where are we not growing, what's it seem like God's trying to do here in and through FBCG. And so we've eventually put together um, what we're calling for today, Growing to Serve Phase 2, the next phase of Growing to Serve. And it's different from what we thought we were going to do on the south end of this building five years ago, four years ago. Just like it's different than what we thought 10 years ago that we were going to build a 2,000 worship seat center out there because things change. Uh, situations change. Nation changes. Economies change. Ministries change shape. Culture changes. So this is what we uh, came up with, and I'm going to start taking you through this now. And we'll get to answering the question of how much is it all going to cost? Uh, we came down to uh, sort of must-haves, given what best we can tell about what God's doing here, what he wants to do, and then want to have. Wish we could do. Uh, among the must-haves is uh, acquiring the Mill Creek Faith Baptist Campus. Uh, that's because uh, that's on our table right now. That's the opportunity we believe God has given us. That's developed uh, the vision of becoming a family of neighborhood churches. Uh, it's an incredible location. Uh, hopefully you've driven out there and seen where it is with regard to our community, our wider community. You've seen on the map where it is, located smack dab next to one of the largest single-family uh, dwelling uh, home units, neighborhoods, and this whole county. Um, it's not been penetrated fully by any means, uh, by our church or any other. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of property, and it's sitting right there. So we think that's a must-have, acquiring that property, acquiring their debt, which right now is about a half a million dollars. We get everything there for about a half a million dollars. The property itself is worth three times that much, maybe four times that much. Uh, but the facility is woefully lacking to be a quality facility for that neighborhood that we're trying to reach. It does not have a viable worship space for what we would want to, ha want, want to have there. It doesn't have a viable, secure children's space. And if you don't have room that's safe and secure for children, you don't have room for their parents. That's just the way churches work in our culture. Um, we need to build there and add to that facility, we believe. Do, do we... I don't, I don't, we don't have to put a picture up right now, but we need to add a small 300-seat worship center to one end of it. Yeah. Okay, see there to the left side there? That, that little worship center does not exist at this facility right now. They're worshiping it all the way to the right in that box to the right, which we need for a large children's ministry area because it's not suitable for a worship area of the church to sustain the size that we think that needs to grow to initially. Just to help, just to help orient you a little bit, down in the lower right-hand corner, you see the gray box existing, and then the dotted line to the left, which Brian just mentioned, that's the existing facility today. It looks a lot better on the outside than it is when you walk on the inside. It, it really is lacking, as Brian said, but that's the addition we're talking about as a potential on the, on the left. In fact, the reason why we initially said thanks but no thanks is when we walked inside that facility and saw it. It just, it just 
We just couldn't see how it would work, and it won't. Um, but the, the, the property is beautiful, and the location is outstanding, and the opportunity is just amazing, but it's going to take investment. It's going to take building a small worship center. It's going to take fixing the children's space. And if we do that, we can move our hand-in-hand preschool ministry from our East Campus to the Mill Creek Campus, very close to where all those children live. Uh, and if we can move hand-in-hand over there, we can expand Shepherd's Heart at East Campus, which I'll talk about in just a moment. So that adds up to a number. I'll come back to that later. Another part of must-have is right here at this campus. Growing to serve second phase needs to include this campus. The first thing we need to take care of here is expanding and improving our nursery space. Like I said, if you don't have room that's safe and secure for people's children, you don't have room for them. And moms can make that decision in about 10 seconds when they walk into a building. This space has been adequate for us on weekends, but our midweek, particularly our women's ministries, where all those women come with all their children, they've maxed out and we actually are having to shift uh, uh, babies and toddlers over to our Masterpiece Ministries rooms, which are not built as nurseries. We need to take care of that in this next phase. That's a felt need right now as we sit opening our fall ministries. Uh, We're off to beg and borrow over the next year until we get this done. Second thing we need to do at this campus, must do, is up above our heads here. Uh, Some of you have probably been in here when it's been leaking, raining inside the building. This building has leaked since about the second year that we had it in existence. It's got significant design flaws on the roof of this building, including our, uh, I think I'm saying this right, our air handlers up there also at at the place in their life they need to be replaced. Uh, That alone that none of you ever see, but require, that's the infrastructure of this building, that's, that's like a half a million dollars of work up there. And that, that hurts because that doesn't create any new space for us. It just makes this space usable right here where we're sitting right now. Uh, we have to get those two things done. Those are must-haves. Uh, we'd like also to move, uh, and our design, Aspen keeps reminding us that they didn't build that problem up there. Um, we would move also uh, our, some of our offices, our children's ministry offices up here. We'd like to move them down to the lower level, close to the children's space down there. That liberates that space to, to expand our nurseries. So it's all, all these dominoes are all related. Now, um, what we'd like to have, not a must-have, but a like to have in this campus is addressing this room right here. Remember, this room was not intended to be a a permanent worship room. It was was a temporary fix until we built the massive sanctuary out there. We're not not building a 2,000 seat. We're not building a bigger and bigger box and more and more people are driving further and further away to fill that box. We're not going to do that. That would be about a $25 million project out there. We're not doing that. But we think we would like to be able to address this room uh, and make it carpeted, make it a worship center, still, still possible to use for multi-purpose purposes, but it wouldn't be a gym anymore, it'd be a worship center. Expanding the stage, doing some things inside here with acoustics and all that stuff. We'd like to, but that's, that we, we, we've come to terms that that's not a must-have, that's a like-to-have. We can, we're all used to it. Visitors don't find it very comfortable, which is an issue, but we'd like to have that. Growing to Serve 2 should also, at the East Campus, deal with Shepherd's Heart. That ministry has been exploding ever since we gave it its own space, and it's trying to grow. Remember I said, noticing what God's trying to do? That ministry is just, is just how we would say it, is blowing up in a good way. It's three times the size it was uh, two and a half, three years ago. Um, and they need more storage space for the goods we're carting in. They need uh, cold freezer storage space. Uh, Northern Illinois Food Bank will give us freezers for, for frozen goods if we just had the room to put them. Um, they, they need counseling space. I mentioned this morning in the message, they're doing a lot of counseling with folks. Uh, this is a gospel ministry, not just handing out food. They see it as ministering to people full range in the whole scope of their lives, counseling their finances, sharing Christ with them, and giving them food, and they need space to do that. And so if we acquire, here's the dominoes, if we acquire Mill Creek, if we turn that children's space into a viable children's ministry space and can move hand in hand our preschool from east campus lower level to there we liberate space in the lower level of the east campus to give them the storage space freezer units and counseling space all at one time but we have to do mill creek correctly in order to do that so the investment there gives us the grow, the room for shepherd's heart to grow in this next generation will shepherd's heart always be east campus we don't know that can it grow there right now yes if we move some stuff off of east campus so uh, must abs and want to haves now, the, the final thing I want to share with you uh, are some numbers. Remember, uh, we left on the table with Growing to Serve the south expansion of this property, lobby space, offices, and all that, and that was, and a 300-seat venue right out there in the lobby. All that was part of that, that process. We left. We didn't do that. And that, to our best guess, was roughly 3 to $4 million on the table at that time 
four years ago. Today it would be more closer to four and a half-ish or so if we opened up construction again and did exactly that. So that's what we left on the table. Our estimates right now that we've received are that we can get, we can acquire uh, Mill Creek, their debt, build out their sanctuary, uh, appropriate children's space, move hand in hand, expend Shepherd's Heart at the East Campus, uh, expand our nurseries here at this campus for about four and a half to five million, about that same amount we had out there at the South Campus. Our want to have is addressing this room. If we add worship space remodel, this room right here, that would take that final number to the five and a half ish, moving towards six million to do that. So that's where we are as leaders. This is not a done deal. We are very much in the wrestling. We were at a meeting last night that lasted from 6.30 to 11 o'clock at night, wrestling through all these numbers, all these dominoes. What can we put before our church family? What's appropriate to put before our church family? We have a long history of trying to deal with these things, um, being careful of debt, investing only what's appropriate, investing what we can see what God wants to do. So we are very much needing uh, to, to bounce that off your hearts and minds. And we kind of want it to run right through you and right back to us again in terms of gut reactions, first blush, how's it hit you, uh, what do you think? Give us your thoughts, because it's not a done deal right now. These are just want-to-haves and must-haves. We're presenting the vision to you as best we can tell that God's leading us. So at that point, having said those things, I'll turn it back over to Ken. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. So um, normally now we'd, we'd ask you for questions. And if you have questions, we want to answer those. But as Brian said, what we'd really like to do is just start with getting some feedback. Bounce, bounce, we've, we'll we've bounced a lot of things or at, sent a lot of things at you. We'd like you to bounce back with some feedback. What do you think? What are you hearing? What's your impression? Um, and let's just have that. We're not going to respond to that at first. We just want to hear back from you. So we'll start here. So if you are, um, it sounds like you're taking space away from children's, children's space away from the East Campus so that to expand Shepherd's Heart. Yeah, it would just be the spaces, the, 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 I don't know how many rooms it is, maybe three rooms four. or four, maybe four rooms that Hand in Hand is using. We still have other rooms that children's ministry could use at East Campus. We're not taking away all the children's space, but the, there'll be appropriate space at East Campus for East Campus children's ministry to thrive. Okay. There's, you know, down in the lower level on the, on the, <laughs> which end of the, the uh, west end of, that, of the East Campus and lower level, there's a whole bunch of rooms in space. That are not used Sunday morning. And they're not being used. Okay. All right. Yeah. I didn't want to see you yeah. taking no, away per, children's right. space great from question. the East Campus. It's a great question. We don't, we, yeah, great, great question. We will not. Right. We're looking for comments, too, as well as questions. Just yeah, comments. mostly comments. <laughs> just feedback. So I had a reaction about this room. It just seemed to me like we ought to have a year or two's worth of worship at Mill Creek and see how that matures before we invest to see what the impact of having people go there has on who's coming here before we start building out in this room again. Yep. That's just but, a by the way, that's, that's exactly why that, this landed on the want to have instead of the must have, because we believe that one needs to have a viable worship center and we're willing to do that before this because we're kind of used to this. I don't, but I also want to point out though that we get feedback from visitors that this feels like a gym and it feels like it's, that it's not a worship center. So Great. More feedback. Thank you. I'm going to squeeze through. Excuse me. Do we have another mic on this side? We do. Ah, okay. Thanks, Russ. Uh, my question is, uh, you talked about earlier where some of the large event uh, things that happen, we have to turn people away. How does whatever we're doing here address that so we don't have to turn people away on the larger events because if things continue in the path that they've been taking it could be more and more people having me turned away yeah and that's a great question we do we have a problem uh, uh, part of that we'll get some relief when we send a hundred people or more over to populate Mill Creek when we open that that campus that'll give us a little bit of relief uh, but it won't give us long-term relief really, from the maximum points where we feel the pressure points. We will have to plan around that, doing multiple events, doing a live video feed to another venue somewhere in another part of our campus, maybe somehow linking the campuses together using technology. So yeah, no, this doesn't answer all of our issues here, 
at West Campus, particularly, this is, this is the growth engine of our church, this campus right here. This is where our biggest things happen. Um, starting a new campus will help that a little bit, mm-hmm. but long term, we still face challenges. What, what kind of uh, ministry staffing is necessary at yeah. Mill Creek to be able to make that uh, function and build that kind of ministry base? Yeah, that, uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, what we know for sure, again, to use the phrase must have, what you have to have on day one when you open is we would have a campus pastor uh, whose, pr- whose primary ministry role is that campus and those people, shepherd of those people, uh, worship staff, so we, we're not certain if it's full or part-time, but somebody who's committed to leading the worship ministries of that, uh, worship services of that campus, and children's staff. So if you think of a three, three people, campus pastor, worship, and children's. Would they need more? Uh, perhaps. Would they need them sooner? We, we hope so, but that, that's uh, like on day one, kind of the, the bare minimum, we think we would need that. Um, which gets at the, the preaching model a little bit. We would think, it, I've said this multiple times, but we're committed to a, predominantly live preaching. So we're, we're not talking about put, just putting a, a screen in. Um, we would want to have the capacity to do video uh, venues it, on occasion where it's needed strategically. But So that campus pastor would preach there at least two times a month live, as well as lead this, that staff and, and oversee the ministries of that about, campus. Talk about but, representing versus... Yeah, um, we use the phrase, and this we got this from Jim Tomberlin, that... Um, one of the great things about the location and proximity is that you don't have to reproduce every ministry you have. You can represent them. And that's a, really, a, a real strength of this. Is we don't have to reproduce all the great midweek ministries and all the things that go on. We can represent them there. We don't, and for that reason, don't have to duplicate staff for those ministries. But at the, at, the, at the minimum, campus pastor, worship director, and children's ministry. Back to Russ and then up front, right? Yep, Keep, hold on, Bill. Um, to be honest, when I first heard your estimate, of a new sanctuary at the other facility of 300, I wondered if that was too small. And yeah, it's just a question mark in my mind. I don't know, Bill's asking how many people currently attend there. Um, I don't know how much room they would have for children's ministries on a Sunday morning in terms of how big the sanctuary is. But I also didn't know if you had an, an idea of what type of venue that's gonna be in terms of the worship. Okay. What kind of a worship service? Style? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you. Your first, uh, your first reaction, is it too small, is, is one that has been voiced by members of our executive council leadership staff as well. Currently, what you see on the right side is where it says kids' large group room. That's where they worship today. Uh, it's not a great space inside. It doesn't, it's, it's not good. <laughs> um, and it seats about 150 to 175 people, so it's pretty small. And, and again, it's not a really conducive space for worship. Uh, we want to turn that into like a kids' station like we have at each of our campuses. That seats 300. You can see that we designed for worship with, with uh, um, natural light, open, and glass. Currently, the church that you asked about their current congregation there, it's very small, uh, 50 people on a weekend. Um, and so they, they're not, they don't have space issues right now. But if this, they don't. But if this was to grow in the neighborhood church model, we envision that it would very fast. Style of worship, you know, we haven't landed exactly on that. Uh, probably so- something similar to what happens here. Uh, talking about uh, this facility and the construction, uh, it looks like it would take probably a year and a half to two years before it's ready to be occupied. Is um, that about right? No, actually, uh, a year. Well, you know, again, we're, we're in, the, in the realm of speculation here and planning as best we can. Our Aspen uh, tells us that they, that's about a year, 10 months of construction. Um, and so for what we're going to do there. Uh, we would probably, to your point, you know, we would, if, if this goes through and if God's in this and our church votes affirmative uh, and we were going to go with this, forward with this plan, we would shut that, we would have a last uh, worship service there as Faith Baptist Mill Creek. We would welcome them and celebrate their history into our services at both campuses and there would be nothing happening there but construction for probably close to a year. The, uh, the goal would be to reopen a year from this fall, to, uh, September two, of seventeen. Uh, as, as the new end, uh, kind of rebirth as something new there. That would give us not only time to do the construction, but also, to Chuck's question, recruit and train and develop the team that's going to go over there, uh, develop the launch plan in its entirety, and envision a group of people that live in that region, not just Mill Creek, but in that region, to make it their church home. So that, yeah, you're right, there'd be a shutdown period. It wouldn't be a year and a half to two years, it'd be about a year. 
Um, I have a question about the preschool. How many students do we have enrolled in that preschool now? Do you guys have any idea? I don't, but Doug might. Where's Doug? Fifty. <laughs> Okay, all right. My comment is that I think this is really exciting to be able to love our neighbors where our neighbors live. And several of us are way out in Sugar Grove, which really isn't that far, and we're not even on that map yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're on the edge. So <laughs> as far as meeting personal needs, taking meals, watching children, you know, doing those hands-on things, to be able to do that in a close proximity, I think, is exciting and wonderful. We know a lot of our people, we have people coming all the way from Yorkville or coming from Sugar Grove and we don't know where God's going to open the next one. We don't yet know if he's going to give us this one. We, we think he is, but we don't know for sure. Um, but it could be. We don't know. Yeah, I just have a reaction about the Shepherd's Heart thing and as a, as a sometime volunteer, but also with a lot of uh, uh, exposure to the people who work and volunteer in that ministry, this is so needed for us mm. to expand that. The facilities as they are that we've put in in place, have, we've, already, we've already outgrown them. And I, I want to thank you, Brian, for the use of your office to counsel. Uh, for, but, but really, counseling space for the, for the folks that we do the, um, yeah. the, uh, the financial counseling with would be really, really, uh, really a wonderful addition to the yeah, project, thanks, Bill. So. I, I wish everybody in the room could, could be by uh, East Campus in on the mornings when Shepherd Hearts open just to watch what happens there. And then on Wednesday nights when they're doing the council, it's just an amazing thing. I'm so, it's, it, you'd be so proud to see what's happening. The people yeah. are coming in there day after day after day and the way they're treated with the dignity and the love. And uh, it's just, it's, it, and, it's, and it's trying to grow. It's just trying to grow. It's what, really, really what, uh, before we go to the next question, uh, we were asked, well, why didn't you build more Shepherd's Heart? Like, why did you build it so small? We forget Shepherd's Heart was a closet in our East Campus and you wheeled a cart down the hall and gave somebody a bag of groceries. There was no Shepherd's Heart. God has done this since we built that space and so, you know, uh, we're trying to pay attention to that. And as you say that, um, Pastor Jeff, I speak so strongly to me that if God intends this process, he will bring it about mm -hmm. as we seek him first. I don't have a business head. I don't have that experience. What I hear, have heard all of you share, I hear such diligence and commitment to seeking Christ first mm -hmm. and honoring him in this process. I don't hear a pride. I don't hear a um, desire to prosper ourselves in this journey but i hear a seeking of him and i hear so so much investment of hearts and time and commitment to this process we come from dekalb we come from dekalb because we're called to be here mm -hmm. and i'm fed so much in being in this church and if this is god's desire for this church to grow then he will bring it about. He will provide the money. He will provide all that's needed if our hearts are committed to him. So thank you, each one, for the, the leadership and um, the effort investing in this. I want to end with a question. Was there any kind of study done that um, produced the number of 300 for that sanctuary? at Faith Baptist, or how was that number achieved, and have sort of projections been made about yeah. the cost of a larger sanctuary there for more people, or how was that number determined? Yeah, it's a, it's a if, you, if you could hear Jean, she asked, how was the number of 300 seats in the sanctuary edition, uh, how was that, how did you arrive at that number? What's the research behind that? And it's kind of a, a delicate dance between affordability, you know, what we could, and, and um, having enough to grow. So remember, we would be, if we fill that, we would reproduce it, have a second service. And you could probably have three comfortable services on a Sunday morning. That means you, and, and, and if you're at 275, you're not going to put 300 people in the 300 seats because it just, it, you know, it, it, statistics say at 80% you're full. So if you're, you're, you're over a 700, you're about 800 person church if we have three services there on a Sunday morning, notwithstanding a Saturday evening service. So there's plenty of room to grow. Um, and, it's still, and we think stay within a, re a reasonable number to afford. Obviously, we, we could build it bigger, but... Um, there's also, I would jump in there, there's also some evidence that, that um, 
sort of the big box era in North American churches is ending. Uh, people are reporting the uh, next generation doesn't really like being in 1,000, 2,000 seat rooms. They like being in smaller venues. Mm -hmm. we've, that's why we've experienced, experimented with smaller venues the last few years. The worship cafe is one, Saturday night is the other. Um, so 300 seats gives you that intimate feel. Yeah, you can multiply it and have a, have a, a, a significant ministry. The other thing is that the, the size, the number of seats in your worship center has to match the number of spaces you have for children in the rest of the building has to match the number of spaces in the, for cars in the parking lot and as soon as you adjust one you have to adjust all the others so that cost number skyrockets further dramatically with each seat you add to this so they all have to match so we're trying to match the sanctuary with what, with what else exists there that we could fix up at a minimal at a, at the, at a reasonable cost right. without having to add a ton of parking quite yet we eventually yeah. would have to add parking, right. but we don't have to right now with that size, if that makes sense. Additionally, you know, our plan was to, put in, our original plan, the phase two of growing to serve, was to go south with a new lobby and nursery core, which would mean we would gut that lobby and nursery core right out there, and that would become a 300-seat venue, giving us a venue we don't currently have. Um, and so, in, in a way, we're saying, we're going to move it down there. We're not going to put it here on this campus. We're going to put it in a neighborhood church. So, so I'm going to do a quick audible real quick. Um, these are great questions. These are great questions, and we, and we want to answer more of your questions. But I also need to hear from you <laughs> your feedback. And, and the feedback comes into this kind of question. Do you like what you hear? Are you on board? Can you support this financially? What are your concerns? Because as, as uh, Jeff and Brian said, we still have to put the final touches on this to bring you something to vote on. So we want to make sure we're aligned with you on what we're going to bring you to vote on here on the 21st. So give hey, us Ken, some feedback. Hey, Ken, maybe it'd be good if we just talked about, like, you know, we're, all we have to vote on right now is the approval of the merger, acquiring the church and their debt, right? We're right. talking about then essentially voting on a proposal that would include all these things we're talking about and would boil down to permission to for, borrow money for a construction loan and then raise, start another campaign to raise the yes. money. Growing to Serve Phase 2, right. as Brian's named it. We have three things to vote on, pastoral transition, budget, merger, and we'd like to see if we can add to that. Uh, <laughs> it's a small agenda, it's really. It's a small agenda. <laughs> it's only going to take a few minutes. We don't have much going on at all. Cheryl. Um, I just want to comment on the beauty of the vision, which when you said, first of all, what does it mean to be a neighborhood church, and you said God's people loving and serving their neighbor, despite buildings or locations or boundaries, what you've done is you've given us, me, a responsibility. And it's the responsibility that Jesus gave us mm -hmm. to love and serve our neighbor. Mm -hmm. And I want to assure you that even though you know that I've had some questions about the brass tags, mm -hmm. the call on our hearts to become the church physically, personally, not to leave it to the management on any mm -hmm. campus at any site, but to be the church that loves and serves a neighbor is a great, high, new call, and I thank you for it. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, just, uh, Cheryl, you reminded me of something. We called an audible our Sermon on the Mount series for the summer. Um, we're going to have uh, the last two weeks of August, the first week of September, it will be a three-week series. At the end of our summer series, before we launch into the fall of the study of Genesis, we're going to do a three-week series on the neighborhood church. What does it mean to love your neighbor? What does that look like? Um, so that, look forward to that. Okay. Uh, one of your slides mentioned getting permission from Shodeen for the merger. Is there any ongoing obligation for permission or partnership with Shodeen? Hand the mic over to Doug right behind you. I'm going to make him answer that. We're not touching that. Doug? <laughs> Doug, Doug, what do we say? Yeah, the, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, when Mr. Shodeen dedicated or donated the eight acres to First Baptist Church of Batavia, now known as Faith Baptist Mill Creek. It came with conditions that will run with the land, if you will. Uh, among those are, uh, should it ever be put up for sale, he has right of first refusal. And secondly, uh, he must approve any proposed additions or improvements to the property. So we have had those discussions with him and he has signed off on what you've seen. So that preliminary has been taken care of. Yeah, you should, uh, should know that you know, when Shodin gave that land, his purpose was to have a cornerstone vision in that neighborhood. 
He wants there to be a church there. He wants it to look like a church. He wants it to be a church. So he's very supportive of this staying a church. Uh, but he does have rights on uh, any kind of improvement to the land, and he would have first rights of refusal on any sale of the property to the year 2027. So, okay. The yes, reason why the guy's a good businessman. <laughs> Are there any uh, restrictions in terms of, uh, from Shodine Construction, uh, about the construction uh, code things and so forth? Are you following me I, without getting into other? Doug, did you hear the question, Doug? Yeah. Well, there's no restrictions. It's just the normal city code and county provisions, et cetera. The building he has signed off on are proposed improvements. And he has no rights to build it himself, no? Yes. If for the series of any kind of construction that would happen in the future, all we have to do is get his permission from the design, and then he has no other, no other association with it. Did that, did that get you? His right? primary interest there was to make sure that there wasn't a McDonald's or a strip mall at that location. Uh, that's the, it's not so that he could build it himself. Over here. And then. Um, I've attended multiple uh, meetings, and as I've heard you evolve this idea, there's a piece that comes over your vision. There's a piece that comes with knowing that you are not, you, we as a church, are not just thinking of putting another church out there, that we are extending ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's also a piece in knowing that we have a financial responsibility to do that because we can't grow ourselves without a financial commitment. And even with the number that you threw out today, there wasn't shock in my soul. There wasn't a movement of this is too much. There was peace, knowing that there's been a lot of thought behind it. And every additional cost you put on is there to grow Christ in our community. And that is an acceptance that my soul says is what we need to do. And the cost is not extreme. It is something that we can do as a community. Thank you. Let me jump in there for a second. I can't see quite far. What's your first name? Mary. It's Mary. Mary. Um, let me just give you a little window. I told you about this. We had this long meeting the other night, <laughs> Senior Leadership Executive Council, and we were wrestled through all kinds of stuff. I mean, we have a wonderful leadership team. You would we're, have had shock if you'd been at me. We're honest. We're, 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 we're at a place now where we have, we have honesty. We have, we have long-term leadership. We have uh, people have been through the, you know, the battles of church leadership together and all that. And we confront each other, and we argue about stuff, and it's, it's, it's really a great environment. But at one point, I told them, I said, look, you know, when we got to the, these numbers, you know, there were some higher numbers and some lower numbers, and we, we, the one we put out there to you, um, I said, let's pause for a second. What this means is, what it means to me personally is, I'm not, I'm not quite finished personally with my commitment to the first growing to serve. I'm getting there, but I'm not quite finished yet. This means I have to answer myself, before I put this in front of you, before we put this in front of you, am I willing to re-up again right away for that same commitment again? Am I willing? Okay, that's what it means to me. That's what it has to mean to us as leaders. We talk about that around the table. Are you all in? If we do this, we're not just putting it out to you and say, well, somebody will pay. Somebody's going to pay for this. No. I'm gonna pay. If I'm all in on this vision, I'm going to pay for this. And so my answer to you right now is this vision is so powerful and so strong and so exciting and so... It, 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 what, it resonates that uh, I, won't, I, won't, I won't hesitate. I mean, again, come January, whenever we launch this next thing. But that's only me. Every single leader here is going to ask, ask that, answer that question. All of our staff members are going to ask that question. Hopefully all of you w would eventually ask that, answer that question. Because if God is leading us in it, it has to be worth it. And it's not somebody magic out there that's going to do it. It's all of us considering what's our part. Just like that church did in 1944. Our, our ancestors yeah. with fourteen hundred dollars. I wish we could do it for fourteen hundred dollars. <laughs> Thank you. You know, um, <laughs> when, you know, when Brian first started talking, he talked about things we like, top of our priority list, must-haves, like-to-haves, and those priority differentiations. When when Aspen worked with us through focus groups and and um, when we got everything on, they they gave us a plan for all the, of our wish list, not just the must-haves, but the like-to-haves, and it would be great if we could have all the things in our next project. And that number would have, you would have all run screaming from the room. That number was in excess of $10 million. And we thought, we just, that's just not responsible. We can't do that. Yeah. $10 million, Kevin. So, yeah. One uh, question is, uh, could you put the, the picture back up of the layout of the new facility? 
Okay. Uh, as I look at that, there's not a lot of room. You got four classrooms plus a large group room. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a basement under this? No, there's not. It's built on grade. Okay. Uh, in order for you to get the, the, uh, the programs going out there, is that going to give you enough room? Those four classrooms plus the main the room? Yes, we think it is. We've done a lot of work with our own staff on that with Aspen. However, uh, to your point, Tom, uh, at, the at the lower le edge of the large group room, we ha do have a plan that involves putting two more rooms on that edge of it with a Jack and Jill combined bathroom to expand. Be very cheap and easy to do as we grow. They'd still give us enough large group space for children and add two classrooms without having to add, add any exterior walls. Um, but right now, we think this will meet our needs for the, you know, for the first iteration. Okay. Now, the other question is, uh, from a financial standpoint, would you propose a special uh, drive to raise the money for this, or would it come out of current revenues? And if so, what programs would you cur uh, curtail in order to get the money? Uh, our current revenues would not support this on yeah, their own. Yeah, no, this is, this is a phase two um, campaign very much, as a matter of fact, it, it very much mirrors the last one we just went through. If you think about the numbers, the proposed level of debt that we would acquire to uh, do the construction and work through the raising of funds and paying off the funds almost exactly as we have over the last three years. So it would not come out of existing funds, not come out of existing programs. This would be a new fundraising campaign. Okay. And we, now, I, I, uh, for those of you who are just saying, well, let me see the details. We are planning to provide the details. We're working through that. Wanted to hear back from you and still want to hear more back from you um, in terms of your impressions. But uh, come the first week of August, we're going to send out the details of the fundraising campaign, what we expect that would look like. So you'll have plenty of time to review that before we ask you to vote on a proposal uh, on the 21st of August. So we will give you some more of that detail. Uh, but we had, had to hear back from you first, is do we, do, do we proceed? Is this within our realm of ability? Uh, and so that, that's what this is really wanting to, to discern for this conversation. Yes, Brian ma'am. Brian is in the bathroom. He didn't run out on us. Well, yeah. He's done answering questions. Sorry. I, this is just very small, but when, when Tom had you put that back up, I wondered, are some of the rooms, will those rooms for adult education or are they all children's? It just occurred to me when I looked up uh, there. Uh, the large group room and uh, some of those rooms could be, the larger two rooms of the children's could be used midweek, but there would not be adult rooms on Sunday morning in this iteration. Okay. There would not be space for that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to, to say that honestly, when you shared that estimate, that number, I was very, very surprised. I expected a much, much larger number. Oh. And that excites me because I have been at other churches uh, that were trying to do similar things to develop uh, their sites, to expand with much, much larger numbers. Uh, and the other thing that I noticed is that you guys mentioned uh, in the must-haves was the shepherd's heart and a lot of things that were designed to serve people and to practically bring the gospel to people. So I'm really excited about this because I, I, I really am not worried about any number. You could have put 50 million out there and I know that God can raise however much money he wants. What matters is what is this going to be used for? Uh, although I am glad it's not 50 million. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what matters to me as someone in this church is what is my leadership going to be doing this for? And I think it's been abundantly clear that you are doing this so that people can hear the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done and that they can be served and loved. Uh, and so I'm excited about getting to see ministries like Shepherd's Heart expand. Uh, and I'm excited as well to be part of a church whose leadership values using their money wisely because, again, that number is much lower than a lot of churches that have done similar things that I've heard. Uh, and so I know that that must have took a lot of hard work to cut and to trim and to be wise and shrewd with your money. So uh, I guess as a member of this congregation, I say thank you to you guys as our leadership for uh, choosing to be wise uh, above being uh, just exciting. Uh, I think that means a lot to me as a member of this church. Thanks. Thank you. And I should stress... The roof won't leak. And the roof won't leak, that's yeah. right. <laughs> I should stress we are talking about American dollars, not pounds or euros. So just for clarification, I didn't know. Just, just a little something there. Yes, ma'am. 
<laughs> would our congregation here be paying the salaries of the people who uh, serve over there for a few years or a year, yeah. you think? I would think uh, so. Good, good question. Thanks, Betty. We talked about that in previous meetings, but in case you didn't hear that, they, uh, Grant Diamond is their pastor right now. Uh, Grant just had a baby boy, Rory is his son's name. His wife had the baby. Uh, well, yeah, his wife had the baby. I think he was, in, he was observing. Um, thank you for that correction, yeah. Pastor Brian. Anyway, he... Um, well, watch everything he said. <laughs> right, right. They, uh, we would not retain them on our staff. Uh, pardon? I, do you ask his me question why? question was why. Uh, I one think of the main reasons why is that Grant is uh, feeling called to move back to Texas, where his wife is from, and plant a church in that area. Um, and so he's their only full-time staff member. Uh, we would not, so the only staff obligation we would have would be to, we're going to pay, we're not going to just cut Grant loose. We're going to pay him uh, um, a lump sum of salary and benefits for up to 12 months uh, so that he can have a good start on that, uh, on, his, on his church planting venture. But there would be no ongoing staff obligations from this church. And Grant is very much on board with that, as is, as is their uh, membership. So that's all been vetted pretty thoroughly. Right here, please. Oh, my question is, you have a vote coming up on the 21st, and it's, is that going to be just a one-day vote? And you're, look, you're also saying that you're going to have 75% to, in order to move on to the next level. Is that of the voters, or is that of the membership? And can you define who would have the opportunity to vote? Ken, you can handle Yeah, let me, let me if, yeah, thank you. So um, from, from a standpoint of our bylaws, what's required to uh, move forward with that kind of debt assumption and that kind of expenditure is a 75% approval from the ma a majority or a, a, of the a membership, 25%. Yeah, so um, let me say it right. We have to have 25% of the membership voting, and of that 25%, 75% has to approve the proposal for it to pass. Okay. Members, now, yeah. the only ones who can vote on this is actually members of the congregation who own the responsibility for managing the church. This is a lay-led and managed church through proxy of the executive council to the church leadership. Does that make sense? Good. Anybody can come to those meetings and participate in discussions, but voting is for the members. Yeah. Before we got into the, the last um, fundraising effort, um, I know there was a lot of concern as to whether that would pull back from what our, uh, I guess you would refer to as our foreign missions um, would do um, financially. This morning over at East Campus, Pastor Bruce gave us a marvelous overview of what's been going on, and it's been um, just exploding. Uh, and I think as we grow here, we grow globally. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a wonderful opportunity to add to the people who are um, responsible here to yeah. be also responsible globally. And it seems to work. God bless us at all. Mm -hmm. More than we ever imagined. That, that's, uh, that's a very important point, which a lot of people miss. For just, you said, as we grow here, we grow globally. Our, our global impact is connected to our local uh, growth and expansion. Shepherd's Heart served the world of, uh, Brian mentioned it in the sermon this morning, raising now over a million dollars in the last three years in, in addition to everything else we do uh, above and beyond our general fund to give away. None of that happens if we're not expanding our gospel impact locally. Uh, Brian, going back to 1944, none of this happens. So I think it, sometimes we, uh, I'm glad you said it that way, because sometimes we slip into thinking it's a zero-sum game. Well, why spend this here? We could just give it away to missions over there. It's, it, it's not, it doesn't work like that. As, as the local church grows in its impact, its, its global reach and impact expands as well. Yes, I have a comment in regards to uh, resources that I was talking about earlier. And I have uh, the preface, I have a lot of respect for the businessmen of this area. And there are a lot of capable men in terms of finances. But, and I realize this is something that's way down the road, but um, just for the lesser capable in terms of money, uh, those might be struggling, just perhaps a central resource maybe. 
what's needed, uh, cars, transportation, um, supplies, just uh, hands, elbow grease, whatever, like a central call for resources, I suppose, an easily accessed uh, leaderboard, I suppose, uh, would be awesome to have. That, I love that, and I wish if you can go back and look at some of the pictures of the of the work that was done at the East Campus to remodel the lower floor, and you see a lot of the hands at work there. Those were people from our church, tearing down walls, building up walls, exactly as you say, giving of whatever resources they could give. That's a fabulous comment. Appreciate that, and we will absolutely make that call. Thanks. First, uh, Pastor Brian, how are you feeling? <laughs> a little better every day. Thank you. I had it done three weeks and three days ago, my right hip replaced, and um, it's, get, it's better to get better every day than it is to get worse every day, put it that way. So, still got one more to go, but better every day. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's still coming, Tom, still coming, yeah. Well, we're glad for you. Thank so, you. Uh, the feedback is first, thanks for asking for feedback. <laughs> That's a cool thing, reflects a wonderful culture here. Uh, the second thing is... Uh, Thank you for not being stuck with your prior plans. Thanks for not thinking you had an obligation to be right with how you were thinking previously. We gave that up long ago. <laughs> I've been married 31 years, so. Well, cool. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I, I, I said to someone out in the hallway that um, we, we have looked back at 2008, and we, we, were, we had a drawing for a fabulous worship center right out there. It's what everybody was doing. 2,000 seats, multiple levels. And as the preacher, I'm thinking, oh, how awesome would that be? It's great. And when the economy went south, we put everything on hold. We just didn't want to have to cut any staff people. And in the meantime, we realized we think God saved us mm -hmm. from an enormous uh, albatross beautiful. of debt. It's beautiful. That would have crushed. We never would have started Shepherd's Heart. We never would have done these things if we'd have had that. When a church turns into something just servicing debt, you, you, it's, not, it's just a business. It's, it, and we've talked to lots of church leaders who've told us they regret building their giant box because it's hard to fill, they're expensive, and they never go away. They're, you know, so anyway, so we learned kind of that almost by accident, and we, were, we think we were protected by the Lord at that point. Okay. One other part of the feedback is that uh, I love the neighborhood thinking. Uh, I think it makes me more accountable to the gospel and to the church when all of a sudden those are my neighbors I'm <laughs> going to church with so I've got, a, I've got more responsibility here so in a big box I could hide yeah. a neighborhood church I've called to greater accountability oh, cool. yeah, uh, the final point is a question and the question is uh, what are you learning from the fact that uh, it seems that the church is becoming less relevant and how does you, this move make this church relevant as opposed to uh, kind of like a thing or an activity I might be interested in? Yes, um, great question. Actually, the narrative of the church becoming less relevant is something we hear a lot about today in our, in our media and even in Christian circles. I'm not convinced that's totally true. Our culture is certainly changing. I think the, uh, the, the sort of base level acceptance of Judeo-Christian principles and openness to biblical truths is, is, is not what it once was. But that actually doesn't make the church less relevant. I think it, makes, it gives an opportunity to be more relevant. Um, and to your point about what, what does that mean for us, your point about accountability is exactly the answer to that. Um, the, the way the church becomes relevant is not for slicker messages and bigger productions and, and greater, bigger, grandiose things. It's for God's people to become relevant on their street in their neighborhood, in their community, in their workplace. Um, so that's at the heart of this too. So thank you for asking that really let me, good question. Let me pile onto that too. I, I, I started sort of understanding a couple of years ago, a lot of what Jeff said there, that our, our currency in the world outside of our walls is not how slick our worship teams are or how slick our messages are. Our currency is compassion. People, there are a lot of people in our culture who have real issues with the organized church, real issues even with Jesus people who believe in Jesus or the Bible. But nobody has an issue with caring for children with special needs. Nobody has an issue with feeding the hungry. Nobody has an issue with caring for senior adults. Nobody, I mean, and that's our currency. The more we lean on that and make the gospel visible, our words make sense. 
Right here. Uh, just real quick before you go. Uh, we know we're, we're 15 minutes over and very much appreciate you spending more time with us. If you need to go. Uh-uh, totally this meeting's going until 2.30, we said. Oh, do that? That was in the... With the change of 10. <laughs> okay. So Jeff's going to be here till 2.30. <laughs> By myself. to visit with him. <laughs> Alone. But uh, thank you so much for giving us your time. If you do need to excuse yourself, please. No, but I, I need your question. Your... No, no. <laughs> please. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this will take 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> One, shepherd's heart, is that on the must-have or the nice-to-have list? Must. Must-have. Great, okay. Uh, two, focus groups. Were there ever any focus groups for non-staff members? Maybe to get, you know, some of us are comfortable talking in large groups. I, I love a, a captive audience and an open mic. But some people might feel more comfortable talking about it in a small group. Yeah. So I don't know if that I maybe I misunderstood. I, that's a good question. I actually can't remember. We, 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 they did include yeah. some non-staff people. Okay, some key volunteers from different that's right. areas. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right in Shepherd's Heart and other areas. Yeah. And then, I, I'm the last guy that deserves to be here, but I'll, so I look at this as an acquisition, in a sense, from at least from a business standpoint. I, mean, I know God's in charge, but, uh, so years ago when I worked at a company when we were doing acquisitions, uh, the CEO would always say, so why do we think we're going to be better because a lot of times you're buying, this is, I'll just use, it was a failed church. So what are we going to do? And I, th I think you may have already addressed part of it. But what will be different so that it becomes God's church and that, you know, more souls are yeah. ushered, into the <clears throat> ushered into the kingdom? Andy, thank, Andy, thanks for asking that question. Um, and it's a good one. And it's at the heart of what, you know, it, it, what, what makes us think it's, we're going to do anything different. Well, one is just the simple fact of the infrastructure, resources, and energy, sort of gospel momentum behind this church, our church now. Uh, the, one of the reasons campusing is more effective, statistically speaking, than traditional church planting, not always, but is because you have the feel of a smaller congregation. I've, I've said this before. You ask the average person you'd like to go to a church of 200 or 2,000, many, if not most, would say 200. But if you ask them what they want from their church, they begin to describe the resources, the programs, and the ministries of a 2,000-person church. It's an opportunity to have both, the best of both worlds in a way. So one of the, one of the re things that we have is the strength of, of the church, of FBCG family already. The other thing is the families. You saw the dots on the screen, right? There's, there's only one, I think, maybe two families in their current worshiping congregation that even live in that region. The, so the demographic we're trying to reach isn't currently worshiping there. It's not attractive for that reason. We would be populated with people that do live there and are in that demographic. So those are the, the primary things. But then, I, you know, I, you're right. There's, not a, there's no magic. We talked about this at our, at, our, at our marathon meeting, Brian mentioned. There's no guarantee. When it comes to like ministry, right, we trust God. We do the work of diligence. We pray. We seek him. We do the best we can to put a plan forward, and then we, we trust him. There's no, there's no magic bullet that you can say, if you do X, Y, and Z, it will perfectly work out, you know? But we think, based on all that prayer and work so far, this is what he has for us. So you're right. We don't know. There's no perfect guarantee that it's going to be a thousand people. And, you know, you know, we'll see what God does. I want to know who gave the mic to that woman. <laughs> That's my mom. <laughs> Everything just changed. I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> no, I didn't want to reveal that. Too bad. I only wanted to share from my heart that... Um, we don't belong to this church, we're not members, we're not even regular attenders, but we love this church. And the message today, Brian, was great. Celebrating your history. The mission, the vision, and the values of this church are wonderful. And we love this church, and of course we love the pastors of this church. <laughs> but we were very motivated today, and we want to serve, and we want to give to this church. God is working, and it's all about trust. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Here's to say, yay God, let's go. <laughs> I had nothing to do with her comments, but I love her. <laughs> As Andy was asking the question, and you talked about death and resurrection and DNA, um, how is it being received on their end? I mean, yeah. for, for a group of 50. Yep. It's even smaller than that sometimes. I mean, yep. and, and most of the folks who are still hanging in there with that church uh, are, are senior adults. Uh, not all, but mostly. Uh, and um, we'll get a better feel tonight. But we've met with a small group of them before, and you can f you can f you can hear in their voices the pain. Mm -hmm. 
they they feel like they're living through the death of a church that's 180 years old. I, I would. I, I, I can't imagine what that would feel like. And they yeah. feel they feel responsible. And looking back, there's a lot of decisions they could have made differently. A lot of decisions that our 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 ancestors made differently. Moving, not letting a building control your ministries, all that sort of stuff. Anyway, but it's painful for them. And so we are trying to be, it was one of the reasons we're going there tonight. Jeff and I are going there to talk with them is to give them the pastoral care, to let them know they're going to be accepted. We value your, the, the, the story arc of, your, of what God did at First Baptist Batavia. Um, and try to help them through it and receive yeah. them. And that's why when we, if it goes through, we'll have some sort of celebration here where, where, where they'll know that we ought, we'll show pictures or whatever we can have. But they're, they're in, it's, it's tough. They're, they're, it's hard for them. They've, they've really wrestled. Grant has done a good, Grant, to his credit, is the one who introduced the idea to them as their pastor and led them through this process because he started to see what was happening and what needed to happen. And so, um, so it's hard. We're going we're gonna to try our best to shepherd them through it. I would add to that, I agree with all of that. I was part of what's called the feasibility process team on our team, and some from their board we met working through these 25 issues to find out if this is feasible. You know, we've talked about that, is it even possible? We answered that a while ago in our own hearts. Is it feasible? We're past that, as Ken said at the beginning. We're now in, the, is, is, it, is it desirable? Do we want this? That's gonna be up to us, you know. But um, in addition to the pain and sadness of grieving the loss and the end of an, of a, of an era, there's also been more than a few times when some of them have said, you know, we moved out here for this reason. Hmm. We moved out here to reach people. We just haven't been able to do it. Hmm. And so there's an excitement and a hope that, 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 that God could bring something really good out of this. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to uh, say something simply that's been said, uh, but just in my words. First, I wanted to thank all of you guys that, and ladies that serve in the EC and the planning and the diligence and the prayerful consideration and the devotion of all the skills that, I, that exist uh, on, in that group, in those groups. But the other thing is, uh, fundamentally, what I feel is so key for me personally here is that church has too often been internally focused and attendance focused. And this, uh, what I take away from all of this is it's now an external focus and it's focused on serving more so than the attending. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a powerful thing. So I just wanted to thank you and affirm you all and, and praise God for yeah. all that you do. Thanks, Perfect. Thanks, Brad. Back here. I just wanted to re re reiterate one more time. I hope you're hearing it loud and clear come through from the voices. I appreciate your faithfulness and your God is coming out loud and clear through what you guys are doing. The hard work that your team has done is tremendous, and we only know a tenth of what you guys have been doing for the last several months, so I really appreciate that. I've been a little bit involved in church deaths and church regrowths mm -hmm. and church building processes, and it's painful, it's exciting, and God is coming through so clear mm -hmm. that he's the one that's thriving this, so mm -hmm. I appreciate that tremendously. And as far as welcoming in their members, it's, I can't tell you how important it would be to welcome them with open arms because mm -hmm. it is very, very painful coming through church deaths. Clearly, I'm not still over it from 20 years ago. But so as far as welcoming them in, and I'm sure a good percentage of them are thrilled to get some life back into their church, even though it'll have a different name, a different face. You know, it's still a body of God, and so that's going to come through. So welcoming them is very, very crucial. And then my last comment is, is there a thought, and to bring up a little scary number as far as, is there any thought of increasing the size instead of the 300 seat facility out there to increasing it to take the women's ministries from here and be able to have them there instead of increasing this size? Just make that one be a little bit bigger. I know the numbers are scary and they have to yeah. you know, reference everything, but it'd be okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to offer a word of encouragement uh, and thanks for the planning as well. My wife and I have been part of two other such transitions in other church settings. One was well done and extremely successful. One was poorly done and not nearly as successful. But I want to congratulate you guys because this is biblically based. It's uh, thoughtfully profound, and I think it's financially responsible. So I appreciate that and wanted to state that. One of the things, though, that we did, and the one that was very successful that I wanted to toss out, 
you may have thought about it already. We started a core group, as you're talking about, 100 people, but we started it a year before the actual transition was made. And we met on Sunday nights. We were a part of that. Uh, we had somebody speak. So we developed a bonding and rapport before we ever mm. went to the service mm. and opened the church. That was really helpful. That's, mm. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, great idea. I just want to commend you guys, just like everybody else has. But uh, if I understand it, in 1884, uh, a group of Swedes that lived in Geneva were tired of taking their buggies to church in Batavia. Yeah. Yes, and they decided. Yeah. 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 So, really, that, that church in Batavia, First Baptist of Geneva, started. Actually, uh, actually, Bill, it's a different church. The oh. First Baptist Batavia is not the same, not the first Swedish Baptist church in Batavia. It's different, but there is a connection in the streams that the American Baptists, who was the parent denomination of Faith Baptist back in those days, did help the fledgling Swedes who started First Swedish Baptist Church in Geneva along the way at some point. So that's the connection I'm going to try to make with them tonight. We did the research. It's not the exact same church that they were right. going to. I thought but the same I'm thing. Corrected. Yeah, thank you. But, 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 but that, that would have been so a cool if it was. It's been a while. It's been a while. So. <laughs> but, but hold on, hold on. The, but the point you're making, that in 1884, people from Geneva yeah. didn't want to... 1894. 1894. Didn't want to make the trip. Wanted a, wanted a neighborhood church, right? Wanted yeah. a church in their own community, which is so... There, there is a connection there. And um, Eric Ullman, is Eric here? Eric, saw, Eric is a morning, church historian, yeah. taught church histories in seminaries. He dropped off a tome of uh, a Baptist history, which I have not yet read through. I've read through some of it, which tells the story of the streams of the American Baptists, the Swedish Baptist movement, the Independent Baptists, and so... <laughs> Uh, anyway, there are more connections than we even know. Yeah. Now, I think you'd all fall asleep, but. <laughs> um, I just have to, to chime in with Andrew and agree with him on the number. Um, I come from a uh, extremely secular world, as you know, but I've spent the last 10 years of my life doing nothing but expanding, um, building um, additions, building new buildings, raising roofs, um, and have spent the last year of my life uh, fighting with contractors over a massive expansion project. So I know cost of uh, structural steel, I know the cost of cement, I know the cost of electrical conduit, I know the cost of plumbing, and I will tell you from someone who has spent the last year of her life, um, hours, that number shocks me how low it is, which tells me that that's God. Did you hear that, Ken? Um, I, I have... <laughs> I mean, I have fought tooth and nail. I have fought with Kane County. I have fought with the city of Batavia. Um, and even though I am in a secular world, um, I have many Christians who work for me. And before I do any expansion, I spend hours along with them um, on our knees praying and have gotten our numbers to numbers people could not believe. But this number is amazing. and. Pastor Coffey and Pastor McAvoy have heard some of my stories of things where God stepped in clearly and um, accomplished things that people told me were impossible to do. Um, so I know what God does in a secular world, um, and I know with that number, that is clearly the hand of God, given that, again, I, I live this and have and am in the process of a, a massive uh, 300,000 square foot um, facility that I'm building <laughs> right now. So well, someday um, we, Marianne, we may need you fighting for us someday. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I always, what I always tell my employees when they say to me, um, and they always say, you know, um, Marianne, it's impossible. I always say, no, I know who's on my side, <laughs> and yep. you know my story yeah, of the I president. I do. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Carl asked a question a few minutes ago about who could vote, yeah. and um, we started in this church not long after we got married. We looked for a church that was ours. That's been 10 years, and um, we've been very content to be pew sitters. Um, I've been involved in lots of churches over the years, and just we were content. We serve here, but we're happy to be, we're not pew sitters. I take that back. We do serve, <laughs> but we've had been happy not to be members, yeah. but frankly, and I haven't talked to him about this, but this makes me be 
the kind, be willing and wanting to be a part of the church and join. So my question is, will there be membership offerings Great before question. August 21st? Because uh, you know, I think I'm we'll ready to do this. We'll get you all in. I love it. That's actually, no, that's this good, is great. That's actually a good idea. Thank you. Yes. We'll talk about that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, apparently there is. Well, I mean, the, this is the, the process. There is a process. And You're we all going to leave here officially members. Ready? Yeah. No. But there, is, there is a process, and it's an important process because it's all a part about making sure you understand who we are and what we're about and what the obligations of membership are. Uh, but absolutely, we'd love, invite you to become part of that process as we would anyone who's not currently a member. That would, that would be fantastic. Thank you for that. You know what? It's 1.30. And as much as I know got an hour. there are more questions and more comments, um, I want to be respectful as I possibly can, 30 minutes too late. Uh, of your time. Thank you, thank you, yes. thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the questions. Now, this is a conversation. This isn't a speech. If you have other questions, if you have other comments, please email them. You can find all of the email addresses on our uh, church website to anyone on the executive council, Pastor Brian, Pastor Jeff, any of the pastors. We, we want to continue to get your feedback, so please keep the conversation going. As I mentioned, we will have some more data in front of you first week of August that will include official motions that we want you to, to have um, to consider for vote on the 21st. So be looking for that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, thank you for this day. Uh, Father, uh, it's been such a wonderful afternoon um, just to, to see you at work, to be in your presence, um, just to be part of a body that is so focused on you and what you'd have for us to do. Uh, we just thank you for the leadership here and the many, many hours that uh, people have put into uh, putting this together. But mostly we thank you for the congregation, the neighborhood, the community that you've given us to serve. And we just ask, Lord, that you continue to guide us and help us to do that uh, according to your will. Uh, thank you for this day. Uh, please bless us all as we travel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.